Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar express, which is Colleagues as Consumers with our guest speaker, Dr. Eloise Leonard Cross, and which has been organised by the CIM Northeast Group. If you're a university student attending today's webinar, then you may want to sign up to the CIM Marketing Club. It will keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the marketing industry. All you need to do is hover your camera over the QR code you can see on the screen, and that will take you through to the Marketing Club sign up page. So I'd now like to introduce our guest speaker for today's session, Head of People Strategy and Experience at Northumbrian Water Group, Dr. Eloise Leonard Cross. Over to you, Eloise. Thank you so much. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm delighted to see so many of you joining us today for this session. Um, so this session is on colleagues as consumers, as you'll have seen. So just in terms of um, my background and, and where this kind of grew from, um, I'm a psychologist by trade. And what I find really interesting is how we can bring science and understanding people to real life settings. I love organizations and think they offer us so much richness to get a lot more curious. And actually, what I'm going to talk about today is focus on a specific project where we really did that. We really um, got really curious about how to do things differently, collaborate on a piece of work that was um, the creation of our living well concept and resources to really enhance well-being. It's subsequently been award winning and um, it's been great to be able to share some of the insights from this, the learning from this program. This, um, this piece of work was done in partnership with my colleague Steph Wood, who's also on the call today and be on hand to answer any questions. But what's really important is um, this was a piece that grew out of the people function because we knew something was needed, but actually was collaborated on with our um, comms colleagues, marketing colleagues and our innovation colleagues as well. So a real, a real collaborative piece. Um, I've always been interested um, as a psychologist completed my doctorate in how we use data and information. So what you will find in today's session is that I'll talk about how and what data we used at different points. I think it's quite interesting to make sure we share that with one another as professionals, because sometimes we want to look at ways we can kind of replicate learning other people have had in applied examples. So I really want to take you into a bit of a deep dive into what we did, how we did it and bring some of this stuff to life and delighted to take any questions either at the end of this session or, um, or after the event. So where did we start off? Well, first of all, I guess it's a spot the difference game. Um, and, and really for us, it's, it's even, more, um, even more of an overlap than most businesses. So 97% of our colleagues are um, customers before they join us and remain customers, even if they leave us, and throughout their, their working with us. So we work in the water industry. So Northumbrian Water serves supplies water in the northeast as Northumbrian Water and in the southeast as Essex and Suffolk Water. So people who work in our business tend to work in our geographical areas, serving our communities, but also consuming our product and paying for that service as well. And when I joined the business two years ago, what really struck me at Northumbrian Water was wow, that's quite a unique model when you've got that overlap. And it really took me to the Virgin Media research for a number of years ago, which looked into how uh, the impact of the colleague experience on whether they retained uh, um, their membership of Virgin Media when they left the business. And it was really impacted by that experience they had with the business, those touch points. And that's always stuck with me and informed how I work and, and how I approach things that I do. So what we started thinking about when we joined this business in this new role is how, how can we understand that better and how can we serve those groups in, in a, a more consistent way? So my role as head of people stretching experience has an exact mirror and match our customer side. So we also have a head of customer strategy and experience and they're linked by our internal comms manager and our marketing manager. So we have those kind of links between us that, that really works across. So in a lot of ways, I guess you could say for this piece of work, there was always uh, already a frame for success in that, that collaboration and that connection was already in place in business. And I know that's not always the case. And a number of years ago, I read this book, The Future of the Professions. And what that really got me thinking about, and, and this talks about actually how many similarities are in terms of the challenges that face our core professions. And although this was about looking at professions, what it really got me thinking about is we have a lot of professional services. We have a lot of departments that serve organizations, particularly internally. And we're often serving the same customers, the same internal group. But often we're not using the same tools and we're not doing things in the same way. And actually, there's a temptation for us to be structured in quite siloed ways. 
what we started to talk about was actually how could we start sharing our thoughts, our ideas, our tools and our resources an awful lot better and start to, to make that really impact for our internal colleagues. In 2016, I took on a role in the educational establishment and looked after comms as well as the people and OD side. And for me, that really opened up that opportunity that different professional areas have tools and resources that really apply and sometimes the exact thing we need, but we don't need, we don't know we need at the time. So for me, my sort of um, relationship with uh, CIM has grown through that, through completing my qualifications and, um, and really being able to start to maximise that overlap between, between the professions. But I think what I would say is this work as a start point is that kind of intersectionality, that support and that relationship and something we've tried to garner and drive a, a lot further as we've as we worked through this piece of work. So let me get onto our project and tell you exactly what happened. Well, we started off um, with quite a clear ambition. So this work started in the summer of 2020. So we'd, um, and like many organisations, had swiftly navigated and put in place what we thought was going to be quite short-term interim processes, support for uh, health and well-being, and our colleagues working in different ways when the pandemic hit. But what we were starting to see was actually this was going to be this was going to go on for longer and you know we were facing a real challenge in terms of what how could we make sure we we're serving all of our colleagues in the right way given this different way of working so what we would um, set out about to do was to deliver one single clear well-being offer and importantly that had to work for all demographics now as an organization our business is primarily male so about 70% of our business are male and um, a lot of our majority of our colleagues work in operational roles so they're out on the front line and um, serving and supporting our customers directly day to day and what we what we were finding was that a lot of things we put in place actually didn't serve that demographic as well as it could um, and, and things that were actually appealing to our corporate or office based colleagues wasn't wasn't working in the same way. So what we knew going into being really clear, first and foremost, this has to work for our different different demographics and we have to reach and land this. So, you know, we really need to understand those consumers in this piece of work. The other thing was to make sure that people were accessing this proactive um, health well-being resource. Now, what was really important, obviously, our business is 24-7. You know, the water keeps flowing. And what's really important is that we preserve the health of our people because healthy people may have less accidents. They're more effective. They are more efficient in how they work, but also they'll tend to be more proactive in the way they spot opportunities or things that need changing. So we knew that if we could start getting reaching people, start engaging in some of the resources that were available to them, many of which were, you know, already there, but people weren't using. How could we do that? And we had a target of reaching at least 75 percent of our colleagues within six months from launch. And the other thing that we were faced with was a number of mental health crisis events. So people in real critical mental health states um, and, you know, taking taking action that would really damage their health. And our intention was to reduce that and um, and not experience those during during the pandemic. So actually compensating for some of the challenges people were facing. We had quite tight timescales for this piece of work. So we started off with this ambition. You know, as I said, this was the end of summer 2020. We knew that we were um, had to have something in place ready for the start of the winter. And I, I'm going to talk to you a bit more about some of the data and drivers we analysed just to give you a real clear picture of, of how we showed our kind of our due diligence, our picture we built up of, of the consumers and their current the current position they were in. So. In terms of where we started, um, we always talk about hearts and minds when it comes to our colleagues. And we always say, right, have we thought about both of those elements in work we do? And it's really simple, but actually it gets people, whoever sat around the table, working on a piece of work, uh, really drawing in the right kind of thinking and, and flipping it between the two needs. So first of all, when I joined the business, I was really interested to understand what matters to our people. At a glance, you know, we've got very different um, demographics here. We've got primarily male operational workforce, a much more heavily female corporate workforce. What what connects them, if anything? What do we see that sort of um, that, that that links this group, and what can we understand? 
the thinking from this comes behind um, uh, the uh, work that I've done in um, sort of mediation. And when you are trying to bring people together, you try and chunk up to the first level you can get that connects people. So I always look for what is a common connection point. And that's a great way of when you get humans together, starting to, to, to create that sort of that shared that shared approach you can use a work for all. So what we started by doing was analysing what mattered to our colleagues. So by that, we were looking across our different channels, across different posts, across different things people responded to. What did they comment on? What did they like? What did they interact? That might be through Yammer, through responding directly to things, to articles they were interested in, through posts that we were putting on social and our colleagues were interested in. It was it was just really across across the board. And what we found was there was three things that mattered to our colleagues, and this it doesn't. This was consistent regardless of age, tenure, uh, gender, location they worked in, type of role, and those were pets, family, and the outdoors. Now. What's, it's probably not surprising to see those things, but those things were really quite important to our people. And if you think about what we do and why we do it, actually, you can see why people will be drawn to our organisation um, You know, on that basis. Our brand is quite well known in the regions we operate in, and we often have employed multi-generations of people. So that family, you know, that connection to family is absolutely strong and something that is, um, you know, live and breathe by our leaders in the business. So that kind of once you belong, you know, we do take care of our people. The um, outdoors and the pets element, you know, we have these leisure, these fantastic uh, reservoir locations, you know, these things are of interest to people and, you know, they're, they're an interest beyond the work they do. So giving us that as a start point really start to help us understand, right, OK, if those three things really matter to people. How do we start to use that to inform what we develop and what we shape? The next thing we wanted to look at was what was going on in people's minds, what was impacting on them. And there was um, three things we really pulled on to help us as a start point. So obviously there was the virus, there was COVID and there was great fear, but also it really restricted what we could and couldn't do. And people knew that, you know, they were facing a far more restricted lifestyle. You know, they couldn't do holidays, you know, they couldn't meet and get together with people. So this was this was really at the peak tough time. The other thing was um, connection that we looked at. So how easy was it for people to participate and access things? And this is where um, Steph and her team particularly start looking at who has easy connectivity, who doesn't, you know, where are things straightforward on devices, where aren't they? You know, so this has been a big piece of work for our internal comms function who've been looking throughout at how do we create um, equality in access to information, communications and resources. And the third one that we knew that was really impacting on our people was um, looking down the barrel of going into winter, which is quite scary. So what for me as a psychologist, a lot of the literature was saying this is going to be a critical point. We were forecasting a bad winter, a cold, quite bleak winter that was going to start quite early after going out the lockdown in the spring. We knew that people who'd kind of been coping by being able to do nice things outdoors would suddenly be potentially quite isolated, but also quite impacted on the um, sort of the, the restrictions that would be put upon them so taking all those into account what we start to say was right that's where our people are at how do we start to design up and out with a blank sheet of paper and what kind of concept do we uh, do we sort of think about in terms of how we position this well, I think one of the key things that, you know, the things that interest our people is we wanted to go really quite non-corporate with this. And our business has always had a, a fairly uh, quite a corporate or structured approach to, um, to projects, programs and things we've put out. And what we got to when we had people around the table, as I say, we had our comms colleagues, our people colleagues, and we also had people from our innovation teams and, and other networks and ambassadors. And what we got to is we want something that feels fundamentally different because people will then notice it. But also we've got to be respectful of the kind of business we are and the culture we have. So how do we find some middle ground? One of the concepts that um, that came out quite early when we started to look at this and actually was starting to be referred to in um, some sort of external literature was this concept of hygar. Now, hygar is not really it's not really a business concept. It's very much a personal health concept, but it really fits well with those top three, those those parts that were impacting people's hearts, but also could really apply to people's minds. And I'm going to come on to describe what Hugar is for you in a moment. But um, the the although it's been around for many years um, in Danish or Scandinavian countries, what we've seen is from about 2016, there's a number of books written on the topic and actually it brought it into the mainstream. 
In 2016, I was going through a double bereavement and it was a concept for me that had massive resonance. When the world went crazy, I was able to pull something back by living through this. So actually it was something we could bring to the table quite authentically through lived experience and say, this is what we think our colleagues need. So let me tell you how we started. So we started by, first of all, at our leadership conference, taking our leaders and asking them just to pause and take a moment. We use an image very similar to this. And we asked them to just imagine they were in this place, a place of calm, a place of tranquility, and they've got space. The day-to-day -day isn't swirling around them. They're looking out on space, calm, fresh, things we can, things we can all enjoy. And we did this because actually we know that sometimes getting people to switch off from the normal day to day and sometimes seeing something that's fundamentally different can really help us think in a different way. This is a really important bridging action. Although it seems small, it immediately started to get our leadership team thinking in a slightly different way. The physiology changed, even though we were, um, we were doing this actually digitally. Um, and the comments started changing and people started asking questions on, right, what is this? I want to know more. Yes, I like that feeling. And if you think this image, what it, what it was about is, you know, you don't have to have lots of stuff and things around you to be able to seize a moment, to be able to start thinking about health and wellness. So we then introduced them to this concept of Hugar. First of all, we'd um, pre-warmed uh, pre our most senior stakeholders, our exec team on this, who are um, passionate about our business and our people, but also up for trying new and different things when it's um, when it sort of got makes sense. And they really liked this as a concept. This was different. Um, and you know what? It wasn't corporate, but that felt right at this time. They wanted to do something different because our people needed something. So Hugar, as I say, is the way we describe it is very much that ability to be able to enjoy the here and now and small and simple pleasures in the absence of the big things. And the Hugar Manifesto, which is um, from the Mike Viking book, is very much about things that people could do. And all of those things were possible even in a really restricted way of living. So, you know, facing lockdown, people not able to get out, you know, they're not able to experience certain things that worked. And um, people responded to it. They, they really liked this idea of making it human and they could see how that fit the, the profiling we had of our colleagues. So at that point, we got we got sign off quite a lot of support. And what I'd also say, a hell of a lot of interest as well from our leaders, which was quite interesting. So I was getting messages about people saying, this is different. I really like it. What are we going to do here? So we started off by talking to our people about it and we actually worked with Mike Viking. So um, the very famous uh, Dane, Mike Viking, who is also, um, you know, sort of the, the real ambassador of happiness and living well and worked with him to introduce it to our people. Because what we needed to do was say, actually, these are about smaller things. This isn't about preaching to anyone. This is about telling anyone how to live their life. But this is about listening to people who live, you know, in Denmark, obviously, um, the hours of sunlight and things like that they live with quite a lot of restrictions it was overlapping with the, some of the restrictions and challenges we were facing so it fit and people were watching this and starting to get an idea of it but in the background we were in about an eight-week period building and developing resources ready for launch at the start of November so what did we do for our consumers well first of all we kept in mind continually what is Hugar? Hugar is simplicity Hugar is, you know, making it visual over words. Hugar is about, you know, making it easy on yourself and also, you know, being quite honest about things. Um, so we really thought that, you know, when we started to build this together, we kind of really took the psychology of what our people needed and those insights we had. What we found is there's a lot of stuff in our business already, and I'm sure many of you have something similar. There's lots of good stuff all over, but actually how people access it in that experience, that front door is actually key for your internal consumer. So we split ours very simply into mind, body and social. Again, it's really informal language. It's simple and one word. And what it means is you can find everything you need by entering one of these three areas. And throughout the, 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 the platform we were building, and it is, it is a site, and it's a site that we uh, should really have those images the other way around, because actually what was really important, and Steph in particular championed all the way through, is 
we've got to reach our colleagues who are in the front line. They have a mobile device. This must work first and foremost for our um, for our colleagues on the front line. So everything had to look beautiful and work really effectively on a mobile diverse, d diverse first and foremost. And we work really quickly with an external partner on this, just a small local um, agency. Well, actually, they're, they're growing now, but they were great. And they totally got how clear our um, analysis of our consumers have been and, and what we knew, we knew we needed for them. So Living Well was born and built and um, our leadership teams really liked it from proof. Um, they, they sort of they really kind of got behind it and said, yeah, I totally I totally see that. What was really important and the first time we'd done this for a, a building for a colleague based um, platform was it was built on Google Analytics. So this is the first one to go with that. But this means that we can continually see where is the interaction? What are people looking at? What's working for them? And, you know, where are people spending their time? And, you know, I'm make no apology for saying we, we're committed to understanding our consumer to make sure we're making it as easy as possible and actually if people are ending up on a two-click site a lot and spending a lot of time there actually that two-click site needs to become a one-click site so you know bringing things forward and really trying to understand that and keep it as simple as possible we have rules around no overwhelm on here you know and it's the rule of three which is a psychologist rule of three is really important three is a beautiful kind of balancey figure that we split things over but actually humans respond well to that simplicity and that's what we found they could suddenly find things and the language was written very much with the colleague in mind and what started to happen well this 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 i realize this slide looks a little bit scabby and a little bit all over the shop but actually that kind of reflects the essence to my mind when you start to get you know this things right for the customers you're serving, what you're starting to get is ownership of the concept. So we started to see, actually, they were starting to grab, screen grab stuff from Living Well and put it into their local newsletters in our directorate. So that was in our, um, in our operational areas. We had colleagues, so there's a little screenshot of our colleague Andy there talking about, he talked about um, Living Well, but also mental health. So we had a lot of very visible ambassadors and people supporting us in the background because we kept checking with those people who were already passionate about this stuff. Does that work is it appropriate do you think that'll engage people and then little things like this sort of message i was often getting messages like this where people started living it you know they started it was it was a tough winter that one you know but for those of you thinking back you know and we had colleagues all over who were lighting candles uploading pictures of you know maybe those moments they had those hugar moments there's lots of ways for our colleagues to engage in health and well-being beyond the, the stuff we made available. So we introduced things like um, online GP, which is a um, doctor for um, basically our colleagues and people who live with them. So they could get a GP's appointment within 24 hours, uh, which was amazing. So, you know, we introduced a lot of things around the physical health space, but also around our mental health, really promoting our MindMates provision, but also the additional um, EAP support and, and things we had that, that you know, were available to people it was about making things easier in just a few clicks in one place which was the most important so accessibility at speed was key and what we found was people were sharing their moments you know we asked in the essence of hugar we had a gallery and we weren't sure if people would interact but we said you know send us your hugar moments and we were inundated with beautiful pictures of people out taking a lunchtime walk or having that great coffee they decided to use their proper grinder to make so it was really multi-sensory and and that was definitely um definitely a different feel have we had an impact well and this might explain why we won some awards for this we really did. Um, so we reached over 90% of our colleagues within the first six months. So that's monitored by unique colleagues accessing proactively the Living Well resources. So over 3,000 colleagues within the first six months. We had three ma uh, male early diagnoses. Now, this was through our online GP. So if you think back to understanding our demographic, we knew our males wouldn't always come forward for health support. But by offering a digital GP that was removed from their own community, actually they were bringing these sort of tougher subjects forward and getting onward referrals. So actually capturing those health conditions early has been immense. Um, and that continues, but this was in our six month period. Zero mental health crisis events, which based on what we were facing at the start of the, um, the, the winter lockdown, we were really concerned we'd see was fantastic. And we also saw an increase in use for EAP, which is our employee assistance program, which is basically the phone line for counselling support. But we saw people using it once we positioned it right and gave our customers what they need in a clear place. We start to see people using it. Um, 
average use is about 35% of weekly users via mobile. That's something we want to continue to work on, but was massively better than we'd ever had before. People were using this. And our overall business engagement went up nine percentage points, which was a huge bounce. And we saw a lot in our engagement data that actually people were talking about this investment and how they felt about our business. So actually working on this as one unique project, it started to permeate far further, far further than just our health and well-being. Um, for us, Better Never Stops, obviously, we were delighted um, last year to achieve our first um, uh, best workplaces ranking. So up in that um, top super large organizations and get excellence and well-being status. Um, they've since been updated to be we're now in the well-being top companies list and um, still in the best workplaces list. But things like Better Health at Work. So that's uh, a program sponsored by the TUC and um, the union and um you know, we got that to ambassador status, which basically puts us sort of at the top of what good organizations are doing. So, you know, we knew we were leading the way, but actually doing it in a real simple and accessible way that other businesses can replicate too. And, you know, that was what was particularly exciting. We did things like re-engineer our language. So we kept thinking about what people want and didn't want. So going back to that, what, how do they want it? They want it simple. We got rid of mental health first aiders as a term because actually people started saying quite, quite rightly, mm, well, you go to a first aider when you've cut yourself. Do I have to wait to see a mental health first aider until I'm having some kind of mental health challenge? Absolutely not. So we, um, our, um, mental health first aiders are actually called mind mates. And just someone you chat to if there's something on your mind. It's that small, um, you know, step to simplify language and take out that corporate feel, which really helps. And we work with a company called Mates in Mind, who we did find actually after we'd named the, the program, but they work really well because they're, they're more focused on construction. So, again, really think about our demographic and campaigns like December to Remember, which is about fun stuff, bringing people together. You know, we did things like virtual pantomimes. So families, you know, family was important. We made sure we scheduled them at a time when and asked um, colleagues to step away from work, sit down with their families and participate in the panto, watch a professional panto. We did lots of little things like that. And that, that first Christmas in particular, which has continued last year, last year as well, because it was so popular. We tried to find ways to connect people, but by continually going back to those three things that connected our, our, our customers our consumers internally those things that matter to them so factor in their family factor in pets and factor in opportunity to be outdoors so it continually goes back to that um, throughout and what also people told us that so this feedback came afterwards we, they start saying right we love it when you are you keep stuff that's really relevant to us and relevant to what we do we love what we do we're passionate about water and you know sort of the environment but we've got still got quite a few different tools that managers use. This was developed mid last year, and this is our wellness reservoir. It's based on um, the Robertson Cooper um, model, but really simply allows every manager or mind mate with a colleague just to have a chat about what's going on that's kind of topping up your resilience, your reservoir levels, and what is draining you out. But I think, yet again, it's an example of we try and get it, we keep challenging ourselves to get down to the least words and the most visual. And, you know, this whole outdoors feel, this sort of simplicity, how can we keep linking stuff back to things our colleagues will use and talk about the same things over and over again? And that absolutely has worked with um, with this. People people pick it up and use it. We just make it really accessible. We share it externally. You know, it's something you're interested in, you know, user version. Um, you know, this is this is good stuff to have. But for us, it's really pertinent because it absolutely speaks to what we do and what we're passionate about. And then just we, we took learning. So Living Well has been fantastic. Winning awards, you know, is great. And what it does when you do apply for these awards, what it does allow you to do is really tell your story and really hold yourself to account in terms of metrics and defining the journey. So we've won um, awards in more of the comm space, the culture space, as well as the people space, which is brilliant. It's a real collaboration piece. But we've continued to use this thinking and it's really serving as well. So two areas just to touch on before I wrap up. Um, we applied a similar kind of thinking to what do our people need and what do we understand in terms of um, uh, attraction and recruitment. And what we got to was actually we started to see there was a lot of people felt in, inside the business. There was this sort of general vibe of, oh, jobs are going to those, you know, how, how did people get that job? You know, 
and, and what we said was actually, well, how do we how do we debunk a lot of these myths? How do we make it transparent? So things we did was we developed a micro site within our existing site with the branding of Hydro, shifted more from jobs to opportunities because we make sure secondments as well as um, structured learning programs go on there. But this is very much about uh, for people saying, right, this is these are not just the jobs. This is what you might be asked for. This is, you know, this is how you go through the process. So little things we introduced include, um, you know, CV or application clinics. They can be done group or one to one, but depending on people's preference, we outline what we do at each stage of selection and why. You know, so again, hold ourselves up to account. You know, sometimes HR is sort of seen as, oh, it's all kind of going on behind the doors. Why? If we need to serve our consumers, we need to feel confident in what we do and why we do it. And we've really, we, we don't have that kind of noise around that. But what we also did was we used that thinking on a design sprint and really said, externally what might make people feel stressed when they apply for jobs with us and one of those things was waiting for references to come through and do I accept do I not am I going to get the job so on that basis we removed um, standard employment referencing it creates paperwork and stress and actually adds very little value in this day and age uh, standard checks and right to work of course that still stands but I'm talking about those sort of those one pages we get back saying yes such and such worked in our organization those little things about continually listening have really helped in that space and we'll keep doing that one of the other things that's really been useful to us is starting to build on the work that Steph and her team have been doing around um, looking at personas. So at high level, really understanding our business through groups of personas. We've taken that one step further and said, how do we do segmentation based on sentiment? So how engaged people are. So what we found is we can basically map our colleague groups through to how many super enthusiasts we have and how we define that right way through to our colleagues who are potentially disconnected in terms of engagement. And that works growing because what's interesting is it starts to give you ways of, again, looking at we're rolling something out. We're looking at trying to pitch something or getting our business to change or adapt to something. How do we help people? How do we help people get on the right bus with this, but also understand we have very different groups in this business and how do we do that? And things like um, starting to uh, work with a company called Word Nerds, so artificial intelligence organization who we've um, worked closely with since they started up. But making sure we have really great quality um, sentiment analysis when people give us qualitative feedback. Because again, I think if you want to understand your consumer, it's not just the actions they take, it's you know what they're saying and, and how we really take that sort of those words and feedback right the way through to depth of understanding. So I could talk about that all day, but I'm going to stop now and say thank you so much for listening. Uh, my contact details are there. If it's, if it's sparked interest or anyone's doing something similar I'd like to share, obviously I'd love to hear from you. And also Steph's details are there as well. And I think we're going to now pop over to have some um, question and answer. Brilliant. That's great. Thanks very much, Eloise. Um, and as a user of your services in the northeast, it's, um, it's quite interesting to hear from a, an outside point of view um, what you've been working on. So we're now going to have a short Q&A session. Um, before we dive into the questions, I would like to also welcome Stephanie Wood, who has worked um, with Eloise on this project. And Stephanie is the internal communications manager at Northumbrian Water, um, and she's worked closely on the project. So welcome, Stephanie. It's good to have you with us. Um, so let's take the first question. Um, what research methods and tools did you use to identify the topics, um, which were pets, family and outdoors, um, that meant the most to your colleagues? And I can see how they would to the, the users living in the region as well. So, Yeah, absolutely. So um, so that was working very close with Steph's team, but we already had um, Yammer, which was a, um, a an informal a kind of colleague conversation platform, but actually weren't, uh, you know, using that to sort of um, have those conversations, but actually hadn't really pulled together the sort of, um, you know, well, what are people talking about? What are the themes? So, so we used that quite quickly because um, Steph joined the business just after I did. So we sort of we've kind of grown together in this role as well so we, we both have the same curiosity with that so we're like well what can we pull from that the other thing is we a previous intranet we started to go through and look at what do people use what do they click on when we pop stuff up what what pages are most interest so what i would say is there's nothing um 
nothing particularly exotic or um, complex in any way. We started just looking at, you know, what what are those things um, when we put up events, what, you know, in sports and social did things, what were of interest to people when our colleagues were posting, so say on our external social, we could start to see where our colleagues were engaging with things as well. You know, if we're putting stuff up about um, wildlife preservation, there was an immediate interest there. I mean, if you've got dogs uh, up, you know, everyone went crazy. So I think, you know, it was about trying to say, what are all these touch points we have and what can we pull from each one to understand? Because as I said at the start, my interest is always organisations actually have a lot of this information. Often they're just not asking themselves the right question. So they're not opening the right cupboards to look in. And that's that's what we did. Steph, I don't know if you've got anything to add on that because you did a lot of the looking around. Definitely, because as Eloise said, that so we joined the organisation at a very similar time. So this was a brilliant project for us to understand who our consumers and our colleagues were at the exact same time. So I know Eloise touched on some of the channels there, but one of the first things that we did start to do was to pull on the channels Eloise mentioned, but also everything else that we had in our toolkit in terms of comms. So all of our kind of live sessions with our CEO, any interactive sessions, and we were able to pull together this wealth of information and colleague voice from the business Business, that we thought how can we do this how can we put this together and when Eloise mentioned earlier about word nerds so word nerds is something that we use regularly um, in the customer space so we get a sentiment report regularly to say what are our customers talking about and it was just that little moment of going why have we never used this with our colleagues before it was that kind of light bulb moment um, of how do we start to use these tools to really understand our colleagues and it was it was to massive benefit for this so um, at the same time as doing this project I was selfishly looking at also building a brand new intranet for the company so this was a brilliant brilliant platform to start pulling all of that together and start to use some of this information and insight we should get so always always look at how do we try to understand our customers and how can we make that relevant for our colleagues Okay, um, next question. Um, someone saying that they ha in their current business, we are facing quite a lot of frustrations around the subject of internal promotions. Can you highlight the top three things you implemented, because you said three was a key number there, didn't you, um, in the recruitment process for roles that improved sentiment around applying for opportunities? Yeah, okay. So um, the first one was one location for all roles and opportunities that was accessible um, both in work and outside of work. So that was really important. Um, we housed ours using our external website rather than our the internet we had at the time. And the reason for that is you can access it anywhere because a lot of we know sometimes the, the closer you are to a corporate head office, the, the more you know, connected, you feel, you know, well, yeah, I know what's going on there, I know how that works. And actually, we knew the people who the sentiment was actually coming from were the people who were, who were slightly more removed from that. So one location that was totally accessible inside and outside of work, because you were an operational person, it might be hard to look at those um, at, at certain times. So one location. The second one was about um, being very clear and transparent on your processes. If you don't state, you know, we use, um, you know, sort of scenario based inter interview questions these are this kind of thing we use them because what your you know assessor is looking for so we played out a lot around the the process so being very clear on when you apply for a job what is the process and what are some of the tools we use and it might vary depending on job but you should still detail them all and say you'll be asked to do this potentially these things and maybe this so put it out there and then the third thing is around helping people make that jump to that gap it we want good people to be able to get our jobs, you know, and we all know, we will all know have people who are great, but they maybe just don't come across particularly well when we're going through certain processes. So as a business, it makes total business sense to me to say, if we can help people jump that gap, how would we do it? So for us, it's offering that support, be it group or one to one to help everyone get to sort of try and level the playing field when it comes to either interviews, um, work task selection, you know, sort of regardless of the tools you're using, how do you help people bring themselves up to that level? So there would be the three things, uh, location, um, transparency and process and, um, you know, helping give people some of the skills and tools to be able to participate fully would be key. So as well as you've used this as a, um, to aid recruitment and promotion opportunities, have you been able to monitor retention levels within the business? Yeah. So, um, so, so we have um, we 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 have really strong retention levels. You know, we have a lot of long tenure given the nature of the the business we are. So, actually, we've never had high levels of turnover. And in some ways, sometimes you know, any organisation needs to to find that sweet spot of of positive turnover. But you know, it's it's remained in a really good place. We've still got quite high levels of you know people stating they intend to work here for a long time. So, um, so yeah, we are. We're, 
we're continually tracking that and and building on that you know for me the insight starts to come from with our um dni strategy we're now really tracking different groups to say what does that look like at you know people interested in the advert people applying people going through selection people being appointed so we're continually trying to go how do we understand that from from the perspective of so many different people at every step of the way so you've been able to track it with staff satisfaction surveys that this has been in a positive on a long-term basis right. yeah um, yeah so the next question is how did you use this learning to identify and implement any training uh, and if so what training did you implement yeah okay so i think there's a couple of things there i think it was it identified a couple of things it identified where we didn't have people who could access and participate and i'll let steph talk about that in a moment because she's done quite a lot making sure people have the devices they need that work in the in the nature of the work they do so i think that was important it wasn't always training it was about do you have the right tool to participate in in this um easily um i think in terms of training some of the key things we we, we haven't needed to train people in using living well or any of the resources because we designed them with that whole kind of um you know that amazon mindset of you're never going to fail to complete a transaction if you want to with amazon it's so straightforward and that's exactly what we try and do with living well we always said how do people get, get to what they need what we have had to do is work more with our managers in terms of saying don't forget you know to remind people about this stuff don't forget to be talking about this stuff the wellness reservoir you know bring it up have the conversation or talking about health and well-being and work some people find it very easy some people find it really difficult and actually we know that the differentiator is often the manager and leader and how much they do that um, and and you know we early on our senior leaders have absolutely role modeled this you know i can think of so many examples that always stick in my mind and heart um, you know where exec members got up and, and, and they would just talk about you know actually i've been finding this difficult i go out for a walk to the beach and that's my hygge moment so i think for us as much about training it's about throwing light on sort of expectations and what the key people do to enable some of this stuff the uptake and things to happen um has been key but steph i don't know if you just want to add because it was obviously a real value add bit that you did of course so to build on that um i mentioned just a few minutes ago that in the background we were starting to build a brand new corporate intranet so our current one was eight years old completely not fit for purpose only fit for desktop users none of our field-based team had access so living well was a real game changer and the fact that it was something that was available anytime anywhere anyhow on any device but that wouldn't serve the purpose as an intranet so i think that's maybe where the training angle could come in a little bit so um as part of the profiling that we talked about earlier so you'll always start with your data and where are your people based and what directors that eloise talked about but we started to really drill that down a lot further to find out kind of uh, the commonalities between people the discrepancies and we did find a group of people we classified as disconnected users so we did have some people out in the field who didn't have a device so they couldn't even connect with the hub and with our corporate information so one of the little things we needed to do was get them access you know we couldn't guarantee that they would be engaged and they would get involved but we gave them access so there was a little bit of kind of a learning journey and that's gone down amazingly the fact that they can take part in live events and feel connected the second part of that is um, once we kind of got people on this digital journey um, to replace the old intranet, we didn't carry any information over. So we started from scratch and we got the buy in from the business. So from from Heidi, our um, CEO, down to director level, we start from the very beginning to say, what do you need? And we've got content owners now right across the business who own the content on our brand new intranet called The Source um, that is out there. So they maintain that, they own that, and they've had training in that. So going hand in hand with those content editors that work really closely with my team to get that brilliant organic content out in the business. And we also have digital champions. So it would be really comfortable if anybody wanted to reach out to talk about what we do in either of those spaces, but those digital champions in particular are people that are quite keen and quite eager in this space to take colleagues on that journey with them, share best practice and really start to make use of all of the tools that we have at our disposal. So it's been a really big journey over the past 18 months or so. And again, if anybody wanted to have a little chat about what we do and, and share best practice, we'd be very open to that. Great. We've got quite a lot of questions still, and I, I think we're running out of time now. So I'll just ha have one final question um, to both of you. Would you recommend that HR and marketing teams work closer together in more in businesses? 
I mean, yes. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're not allowed to say no. And um, from my point of view, I've been talking a lot to HR professionals. So I have a role with CAPD, which is the professional body for HR. And basically, HR is crying out to learn from marketing. I really, I really do believe. I think there's, I think there's learning both ways. But I do think actually, you know, if we use more of that marketing mindset to, you know, approaching the people proposition, how we communicate things, you know, we see stuff on the media all the time that has been done to an internal work workforce that actually if you were doing to a customer group you would never ever do so for me I think you know there's it's just an absolute it's an absolute no-brainer but I'm a great believer in actually all professional functions in a business can learn from one another and if you're not connecting and working across on projects that's going to be a failure point for your business ultimately because you're missing something even if it's just great learning and insight and firing up that innovation you know you're missing something there's two key collaborations I would say and one of them primarily has been with the HR function. I remember two weeks before I joined the organisation I had private messages from Eloise on LinkedIn trying to solve some of these problems already so you know those relationships can blossom and it, it's been brilliant to work in that space but I also would say that um, the relationship between communications and marketing and um, IT or IS um, to build on all of these platforms and collaborate and do it in the right way so that journey is in the right way for our colleagues and our customers alike but it is about those corporate functions as Eloise and how we can all work collectively and collaboratively. Excellent. Well, I think that's quite a positive note to end on, <laughs> bigging up the marketing function as well. Um, so on that note, um, I'd just like to thank Eloise and Stephanie very much. That's some really sound advice and some very interesting tips that our viewers can take away um, and develop perhaps in their own organisations. Sadly, that's all we have time for for our webinar today. I'd like to say thank you to Eloise and Stephanie for joining us and to the CIM Northeast Group for organising the event. We do hope you've enjoyed the session and found it interesting and worthwhile. We will be back again with our next webinar express, which will be the importance of placemaking in the future of retail um, with Donna Howard as the speaker on the Thursday, the 30th of June at our usual time of 1 p.m. You'll find further details about the webinar on events page where you will also be able to register for the session. So that just leads me to say a thank you to you for joining us today and hope that you've enjoyed our webinar. Take care, everyone, and we look forward to welcoming you again to our webinars in the future.